Welcome. We gather here today in this year of the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. And we are six artists, six women of the Commonwealth, six women who have grown up under the female figurehead of the Queen. And we've been given this moment, this time, by the Community Fund of Staffordshire and the Arts Council England for us to come together to pause and to reflect over 70 years of the Queen's rule and what it takes to make and to be a Queen. My name is Amy Douglas and I live in Shropshire, in England, in Britain, in the Commonwealth. Namaskar, Namaste, Vanakum. I am Arupa Lahiri, a Bharatanatyam dancer from India. Currently, I reside in Gujarat, a state in the western part of India. Hello, Musibia Mutiano, Habarigani, Molweni. I am Philippa Namutebi Kabalika Gwa, and I was born and grew up in Uganda, in Kampala, Uganda, and in Nairobi, Kenya in East Africa, but I now live in South Africa, in Cape Town in South Africa, on the continent of Africa, and part of the Commonwealth. Hello, I'm Simone Gilliatt. I live in Shropshire, in England, in the UK, but I grew up between England and Trinidad, both countries of the Commonwealth. Hello, I'm Ilse Dixon and I'm coming from Aberdeenshire in the northeast of Scotland in the United Kingdom in the Commonwealth. Hello, my name is Shivani Ramlojan. I'm from Las Lomas in Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean, which is part of the Commonwealth. We are poised in a moment of change. We watch the great pomp and celebration of the Queen's Jubilee, an elderly Queen watching over such ceremony that could be her thanksgiving or her memorial. And we watched in a bittersweet commemoration knowing that this was probably the last time. And we gather in the Commonwealth with complex emotions and we feel that balance point between the rulers and the ruled, respect and resentment, companionship, and that pull of whether we really are a common wealth. There is a dream of being a queen, where people are keen to hold great esteem, to always be seen and be the main theme, but they forget. The Queen is the Queen because there's a team who rule the esteem and the way of the themes. And often that means she's stuck in between these super strict themes always being seen and people who are mean and probably a whole load of other things that we never get to know about because she doesn't really get to be a real person like you or me. I wouldn't be keen to be queen. There is, there was and will always be a palace on a hilltop. It's the sort of palace that seems to shift with every phase of the moon, new turrets and windows added as easily as clouds passing over the sky. And in that palace there is a grand courtyard. And in that courtyard there grows a great tree, a great oak tree whose leaves seem to spread out across the whole world, leaves falling off come autumn time and landing in every corner of the globe. And beneath that great tree, 
there is a well. One of those old wells you sometimes throw money in to cast a wish, but this well. This well is different because if you were to cup your hands and dip your hands down, down, down deep into the well and drink the water, it would taste of salt because that well, it's full of the tears of every woman who has ever lived and who lives and who will live. The tears of sorrow, of joy, of anguish, of hatred, of desperation, all mixed together in that great deep well. And when the moon is shining high in the sky, each and every night, three sisters, three fates, three goddesses, three queens, come and gather around that well. The first looks like a young maiden, like a beautiful young woman, and she is at the height of her power when the moon is new in the sky, and she takes a long white thread and she dips it down into the well and moves it around, creating ripples and bubbles, drawing up new drops of tears and water, and she controls what is yet to come, she watches over the future. And her sister, the second of the three, she is a woman at the prime of her life, her power is full when the moon is full and high in the sky, she looks like a woman with responsibility who bears it well, and she has a bright red thread that she takes from the pocket of her long dress and dips down into the well and watches as it makes strange shapes as she moulds the weft and folds of what is, of what is happening right now, right this very minute. And I can feel her tug me along my path at this very second. And the third, the final queen, she is old, she is bent over, her fingers no longer quite work, but she takes a black thread, she dips it down into the water, and she sees what has passed. She knows everything that has ever happened, she knows it all and knows which stories should be passed on. And she is perhaps the wisest of the three. And the three of them together, they have gathered here for this very minute to watch as the world is on the point of some sort of change. They have gathered together to mould and shape the weft and weave of time and space. And they have one shared eye between the three of them. One single eye, the stories tell us. And that with that eye they see what is, what will be and what has been. And at this very moment, they're standing around that well, the moon high in the sky, the eye watching this very moment, this queen and all the queens that came before her and will come before her. And in that eye, a tear is forming. And the tear falls and drips, 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 drips down into the world. The goddesses hold a drop of water, a teardrop, held tight by that skin around it, that meniscus. And it reminds me that in life, it is never just joy or pain, um, sadness and happiness, stillness and movement that somehow in our life, we have a skin that holds those things together. The joy throbs next to the sadness. And in holding that, that is when we live. We meet at the middle of our hands. You reach out to me a gesture of light that sweeps its intention into the darkest of places. With 
the other hand. A curtain of offering pours promising fruit scented with the past. Heirlooms of gold and goodness, a treasury of abundance beneath the mask. There are more ways than anyone knows to be royal on this earth. Let me show you by linking your hand and mine. Let me take you into the gestures that link us, not one place or another, not one form over another, not one body, but many parts. I see your face in the fall of the rain and the redness of the earth. I sense your royalty in the print of your fingertips, embossing the names of all those you hold there in golden thread. As you move through the world, this is what you make. A single tear contains an ocean of emotion and when I feel like there is so much feeling building up behind my lungs and behind my ribcage I like to run down to the beach. It's just two minutes from my front door and I'll run straight down to the beach, take off my shoes and socks and walk into the ocean and then I will start to cry. And I will cry and cry and cry and cry until I can't tell where my tears start and where the ocean begins. And I can feel the hot tears running out into the North Sea and taking that feeling away from me. With each lap and fold of the tide of the waves further and further and further out. And I think about every woman that's done that before me and I remember when I was younger hearing about the decommissioning of the Yacht Britannia, the massive ship that the Queen once owned and I wonder if at any time the Queen stood at the railing and her own hot tears ran down her face and landed in the ocean at the thought of having to go back to land to a life that Nobody is quite sure whether she would have chosen if given the choice. And I let the feeling run away with the tide and imagine all those tears in the ocean gathered together in that one well, that one well in the courtyard of the palace with the tears of a thousand upon thousand of women gathered together. This world, this mortal realm, has long been the domain of men. And so powerful women, strong women, independent women, they've had to push out, find their own spaces in the immortal worlds. And they've claimed the worlds of water, of the moon and the night. There have been many of those women. And when they speak out, when they stand out, when they want to have their voices heard, then of course it cannot just be their own voices that are so bold, but those voices must be infused by an immortal spirit, either God or the devil. There were two women in Wenlock, two women who walked their own path at different times, two women of healing and the land. One was Nanny Morgan, a queen of hellish beauty. The other, Princess Milberger, they said, was infused with heavenly grace. People whispered Nanny's name in fear. 
they used Milberger's as a blessing. Nanny was a witch and she performed magic. Milberger was a saint. She performed miracles. Princess Milberger was born to be a pawn. She was born to grace a man's arm and his bed and she was born to spawn more little princelings to go out and claim the land. But Milberger wanted to claim the land for herself but she didn't want to own it. She wanted to walk it, learn it, know it. She wanted to tend it and to harvest it. Well, there's more than one way to play the political game. And so Milberger, she looked how the land was changing. She saw the old ways fading away and there was a new religion sweeping the land. Milberger dedicated her life to God. She would be a virgin. No man would take or taint her. And her father nodded. He would build an abbey and his daughter would be the abbess and he could see all of the glory in that. And so it was agreed. But not everybody agreed. And as it was, Milberger, she was out riding one day and she was out riding her white mare when she heard the sound of the horn. She heard the baying of the hounds. She felt the earth shake as the horses began to gallop towards there, their hooves thudding on the ground. She saw them coming over the hilltop, a prince of one of the neighbouring kingdoms at the head, and she knew the moment she met eyes with him that she was his prey. She turned, she dug her heels into the sides of her mare, and that mare, she wasn't built for speed, but now she flew across the landscape. On and on they went until they came to the River Corve. Without even hesitating, the mare plunged into the waters, half swam, half waded, dragged herself, clambered out on the other side of the bank, with her mistress still on top of her. And as Milberger crested the bank on the other side, she looked back and there was a wall of water coming down the river. A huge wave that crested went past them, the water behind roiling and boiling, the waters rising and rising, cutting off Milberger from her pursuers. But the prince's blood was up. He glared in anger, but he wasn't put off. It only made the chase more tempting. Away down his side of the bank he rode, looking for a way to cross. Milberger, Milberger carried on riding along the banks of the River Corve, all the way down the Corvedale, turning south towards the Clee Hills, until at last her horse, exhausted, stumbled. And Milberger, she fell, slipped from the back of a horse, hitting her head on a rock, and the blood blossomed around her, haloing on the ground. The men working in the fields saw what had happened. They jumped up, they ran over, they cradled her head. They called for water, but there was none to be had. Milberger lifted up her hand and the horse too raised its hoof. It struck the ground once, twice, three times and where it had struck the ground, clean, sweet, pure water welled out from the ground. They took that water, bathed her head, the wound sealed, the wound healed. Milberger sat up and they said, stay, we will protect you. And she said, no, I will leave and I will protect you. We won't tell him where you've gone. You should always tell the truth, speak out. And then Milberger turned to the field of barley that the men had been working on, that they had been planting. An immortal spirit graced her tongue. She looked at those seeds and she said, grow. The seeds cracked. They forced their way up through the soil, bursting out into the air, growing higher and higher and higher. The men watched open mouthed as the barley turned from green to gold. They didn't see which way Milberger had rode away. And when the prince came later that day, those men were scything, harvesting the barley. Have you seen the woman in white, said the prince. 
We have. But it was a long time ago. We were just sowing this barley that you see us harvest now when she passed this way. The prince looked at the barley. He looked at the men. It was February, in Shropshire. There was no way they should be harvesting barley and he remembered that wall of water and at last even his ardour was cooled and even he knew when he was beaten and he turned and he rode away. Milberger made her way back to Wenlock and she got her abbey and she became an old woman, a much loved woman. She brought healing to the land and the people so many miracles she performed in life and in death. And one of those was to create another spring in Wenlock. And so Milberger has two springs, two wells named after her. One in Stoke St Milberger, that first spring where the horse stamped on the ground. One in Wenlock. Both of them are healing wells like the woman herself. And of course, their water heals eyes. It makes eyes bright, restores sight. It gives clarity to see the past impartially. It gives the vision to see the present as it really is. And it gives hope to see the future and what you could make of it. What happens when women are denied royalty? They make their own. Who are the queens of our Caribbean? And are they as royal if they wear no crowns, carry no scepters, inherit no castles, issue no decrees? The answer is yes. The answer precedes all recorded history and sits secure on a dais built of these islands long before the first British ship heaved its anchor onto our shores. The queens of our first nations ruling in languages we scarcely hear uttered today. Nanny, queen of the Maroons, leading her people to freedom in the thickets of the Jamaican forest. Calypso Rose, the queen of our song, she who dances and declaims on stage, whose lyrics Lilt with the stories of many women surviving. The truth the history books won't tell is that we too were made to be royal. This is how. Let me tell you the story of Calypso Rose. In 1940, into the arms of a large family in Bethel, Tobago. Linda MacArthur, Monica Sandy Lewis was born. A big name for a young person. As she grew up to the sounds of the coastal surf singing its stories, Linda would reach for a new name. Calypso Rose. Her first song flowed from her pen at the age of 13, rippling with as much purpose as the Tobagonian sea. Did she know in her earliest days that she would one day be a queen? As Rose grew up, in the rich vein of Calypso, she sang into the truth of these islands. Her lyrics pulsed with the facts, the faces 
of woman's survival. Every time Rose claimed the stage, she resonated with clarity, with tenacity, with creative fire. To hear her sing was to be transformed. To hear her sing gave so many women permission to usher themselves into their brightest lives. When she sang of pain, we all heard truth and hope waiting on the other side. Nanny Morgan was a witch. Everybody knew it. People were terrified of Nanny Morgan. It was enough if she walked past you into the street to make you break into a cold sweat. And those eyes, it felt like they sliced through you, made you burn inside. Everybody avoided Nanny Morgan if they could help it. And yet, whenever they were in trouble, it was to Nanny Morgan that they would turn. It was a rare day that somebody didn't make their way up the edge to Westwood Common to knock at Nanny's door, coming to buy a, a paste or a potion, a blessing or a curse. And Nanny would welcome them in and she'd send them away with a little packet in their pocket and a story to tell on their tongue. There was always stories about Nanny Morgan. They said she liked animals more than people and her place was filled with animals. It was fair swarming with cats is what they said. And when he went in, the room was dark and he would sit next to a low burning fire and the room would be smoky and he couldn't see the ceiling for all the bunches of herbs that were hanging down, except if you looked harder, they weren't all herbs, but there were bats roosting in the rafters. There were dogs standing guard at the door, chickens in the yard, and when he walked inside, you had to be careful where you stepped to avoid the toads that would be crawling along the floor. Nobody liked going to Nanny's house, and yet, when you left, there would always be a story to tell. Nanny lived up on the edge, not far from the road that went over the edge, and she used to tax the travellers. Not all of them, just the ones that overburdened their beasts. And it happened one time that there was a man who was driving his pack horse up the edge and he was whipping it on and whipping it on and it was pulling and straining. Its flanks were lathered in sweat when suddenly there was a figure in front of him, Nanny Morgan. The horse stopped stone dead, its eyes rolling, huffing and blowing, but not moving a muscle. It's time to pay your taxes, trader. I'll take half of all your wares, if you please. Well, the man, he obviously wasn't local, he started to laugh. But Nanny didn't. Taxes, if you please, half your wares. Well, now the man too stopped laughing and he took that switch and he began advancing on Nanny with it and he was turning the air blue with the cussing and the swearing that he was doing. Nanny glared at him and her eyes narrowed. She took a piece of straw from her pocket and she placed it on the horse's back. The horse's eyes rolled up and back. The back snapped and the horse fell dead to the floor. Better a swift death than a life with you, said Nanny. And she was gone, leaving the trader to salvage what he could. Freedom. Calypso Rose is 82, but no part of her spirit has slowed down. Alongside her music of searing social truth, her songs have echoed with playfulness, wit, and humor across the decades. When she sings of sexual liberation, of older women 
claiming younger men for their lovers. She releases more and more hangups about what Caribbean women, all women, should be, should do, and should choose for themselves. See Rose now, see her, angelic faced with a cherub's mischievous moon, so naturally turned out in her technicolor threads. See her straddling the stage at Coachella, making history as its oldest performer. See her gathering awards into her arms like golden suns. This survivor of sexual assault at the age of 18. This confident, same sex loving woman who has earned every prize conceivable to living musicians of the Caribbean. See her taking her destiny well into her 80s, into her own hands. Nanny Morgan lay dying. Her head heavy on the stair, the blood pooling around her. Her dog sat on its haunches at her feet, its head lifted in agony, its howling grief surrounding her. The cats padded in to sit in silent vigil. Nanny had seen this moment so very many times, each time the tangled threads getting tighter about her, knotting this end in place. That was the curse of a fortune teller, to know your own end. But this now, this was the final time. She could see the red mist descending in her vision, feel the bonds that tethered her to life unravelling. Nanny was a witch. Born too big, too bold, too beautiful, too much to handle, too big for her boots, too big for the small name that tried to contain her. She had discarded it, thrown it away, taken a new name, a grandmother's name that gave her room to expand and grow into. Nanny was admired and desired. She was reviled and feared and hated. Nanny inspired delicious rebellion. She spat at traditional women's virtues. There was nothing ever meek about Nanny. Nanny saw too much, knew too much. Her grey eyes would strip a soul bare and her tongue was a whip of honesty. She would tell you what had forged you, what had made you the person you were, and when she told your fortune, that fate was cast in iron, inescapable. No wonder people didn't like her. And that was what had happened to Nanny. The moment she saw his face, all those other future possibilities faded away, and there was just one path left stretching out in front of her. She saw all the love and the lust, the laughter and the joy, and she saw what came after too, the passion and the jealousy, and then the flash of the knife and this moment now, this moment between worlds, this last gathering of breath, but it has been worth it. They would remember her, Nanny Morgan. Her name would resound down through the centuries. Nanny Morgan, 69, murdered by a man in his 30s. Nanny Morgan, her body found by Dr. William Penny Brooks himself, the instigator of the modern day Olympics. Nanny Morgan, a contemporary with Charles Darwin. And though he had traveled the world to find other species and plants, she knew every plant of Wenlock Edge and how to use it. Nanny Morgan, 
The girl, they said, couldn't even read, with her house full of wheelbarrows, full of letters and correspondence from people all over the country, respectable people who should have known better. And yet it was to her that they had come for advice. She knew the stories that they would tell of the men who had moved her body, careful not to get any of her blood on them in case that witch's stain cursed them. She knew how they would gather up all of those letters and diaries, take them to the Talbot Inn and burn them in a pyre. The men standing guard, the women's palms itching to steal a little of that censored material. But though her letters were burnt, the stories would continue from tongue to tongue, person to person, woman to woman, down the generations until long into the future, Nanny Morgan would be remembered. Nanny Morgan's story would be told. Nanny Morgan's voice would be heard. Nanny smiled and that was how they found her body, smiling. Me Katilili was a Giriyama freedom fighter, born in the 1840s. And her birth name was Mnyanzi Wamenza. Mnyanzi had four brothers and a sister, and she lived in a village where all the children loved playing hide and seek. They'd finish their work and they'd even help each other finish the work and then they'd run to the forest nearby and they would hide and they would play and play and play until it was time to go home. Now this one day they went into the forest and Nyadzi was the one who was counting and all the children scattered in the forest in their favorite hiding places, up the trees and in the bushes. And when she finished, Mnyadzi looked and she found one brother and another and a sister and the other children until at last there was one brother missing and they couldn't find him. And they called and they called and they looked everywhere for him, but they couldn't find him. And finally, they went home and they told the parents. Nyati never forgot the look on her parents' face when she did not bring her brother home. And then she remembered the story her grandmother told her of Mepoho, who had said there would be strangers who would come and they would take their children as if they didn't have children of their own, and they would take land as if they had no land of their own, and it would be very, very hard. Nyanzi grew up watching the land change. And when she was of age, she met Jeka, and they got married, and they moved away from their village to another village not too far away. And it wasn't long before she had her first son, Katilili. And the whole village began to call her Me Katilili, as was the custom, mother of Katilili. Well, she raised her children, but she never forgot the time she didn't bring her brother back home. And she looked as the land was changing and people were being taken and people were being moved from their fertile lands to other lands. And there was nothing she could do. But she looked after her children. And they grew up and they got married and they had their own children. And Me Katilili became a grandmother. And what a grandmother she was. She would tell her grandchildren stories. She would sing with them. She played with them and she cooked the tastiest rice you have ever eaten. <laughs> Me Katilili was a glorious grandmother. Well, as time went by, Jeka aged and got very sick. And Me Katilili nursed him until he passed on into the land of the ancestors. 
And now, Mecca Tilili was a widow, and as a widow, she could go to the elders' council, she could stand up, the men listened to her. And it was a very difficult time. And so very often, they would come and ask for Mecca Tilili's counsel. What should we do about these strange ones who want to take our farms? What do we do? They want to cut down half of the Kaya forest, the Kaya forest. You know, the Kaya forest was the place where the ancestor spirits went to rest. It was full of shrines. It was hard to understand how these people would want to take that place. And when the Council of Elders tried to talk to them the way wise people do, they wouldn't listen. This was all too much for Mecca Tilili, and she started to dance the Chifudu dance. Now, the Chifudu dance is a funeral dance, and it is led by the older women, those who have lived life and have lived the pain of birth and who know just how to hold you in your pain and just how to keep you and to allow you to cry and to grieve until the time has passed. And Mekatilili began to do the Chifudu dance. And people realized she wasn't only dancing for the people who had died, no. She was dancing for the land that was being lost, for the young men who were being conscripted, for the culture that was being challenged by these strangers who had come. And after she danced, she would sit with the people and say, we cannot give them our land and we cannot give them our children. Because in every child who was taken, she remembered her brother, the one she didn't bring back home. Now, it really became worse when the strange ones said, there is a war that is going on. It is a world war. It is big. And our queen, a queen who had never visited them, a queen who Mekatilili's people didn't know, she needed these young men to go and fight. And Mekatilili said no. And she started to dance the Chifudu dance in the village squares. She no longer did it only at funerals. And when people saw her dancing, they knew and they would go and they would talk to her and they would take oaths to stand up to the strange ones. One day in the village square, Me Katilili was there dancing and the district commissioner, Arthur Champion, came and he said, oh my goodness, you always dance. Is that all you do? <laughs> I need to take some of these young men. In fact, I came to take some to join the war. I'm going to take you and you and you and you. And I'll even take you. Me, Katilili was shaking with rage and she said, no, no, you won't. There was dead silence. No one had ever confronted one of the strange ones. In that moment, in that silence, Mekatilili heard a clucking. And there, walking across the square, was a mother hen and her chicks. Mekatilili turned to Arthur Champion and she said to him, Do you see that mother hen? <laughs> yes, of course. A hen and her chicks. She said, Try, try and pick one of those chicks up. Well, Champion went and he grabbed one of the chicks and the mother hen clucked and, you know, she, she fluffed her feathers and her wings and she pecked him and she pecked him and he fell over. <laughs> and the whole community burst out laughing, even his bodyguards and the soldiers who were looking after him. <laughs> Arthur Champion was so humiliated, he took out his gun and pah, 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 pah. 
he shot dead the mother hen and her chicks. Meg Katilili was so angry, she slapped him. And then all hell broke loose. No one had ever slapped any of the strange ones. And they started running and their soldiers started shooting in the air. Mekatilili stood there shaking with rage and she was arrested along with another elder who was a healer who worked with her, Wanza Wamudori. And they were put in a train and taken across from Kilifi where they were. across the land into Nairobi and up the highlands and down the escarpment of the Rift Valley, along the bottom of the Rift Valley until they reached Kisi, hundreds of kilometers away. And Mekatilili was put in prison. And for days she just sat there until she remembered that she fudu dance and she started and she started to dance and as she danced that she fudu dance she found her courage and she felt strong nobody knows how but a few weeks later me katilili and wanza wamdori escaped from prison and they walked they walked they walked all the way along the rift valley and up 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 into the highlands until they got back to their village near kilifi and when people saw her they were ululating and the struggle continued the chifudu dance was danced the people would come together and they swore oaths not to stand with champion and his people a few months later, she was arrested again. And this time taken up north towards the border of Somalia. And there she was put in prison. And she started again the Chifudu dance. And nobody knows how, but a few months later, they saw her arriving back in the village. By that time, Champion and his people were so involved in the Second World War that they did nothing. But the Giriyama people, they were able to keep their young men and they were able to protect the Kaya forest where their ancestors lived. And they looked at Mekatilili and they decided to start a council of women, which she led until she died in 1924. And if you visit Kilifi, there is a statue of a woman and at her feet a mother hen and her chicks to honor that queen of Giriyama land. So the part of this story about the funeral dances always struck me because with my mother being from Trinidad, the national, one of the national dances is the limbo. And I was doing some research on this recently and found out that for some it's known as a funeral dance. It's linked to Legba, who is a crossroads guardian and it was brought over from Africa, over in the ships with the slaves that were all shackled and chained. And there were bars and chains like stopping them from moving. And now the limbo is a place of a lot of strain. You have to back bend really, 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 really deeply. I'm not a professional. People can do it so, so low. I can do it medium. I've always done well here in the UK. 
but I heard that those moves helped them because when they were in the ships and they were shackled, that maybe they could move between those shackles, between those chains and get under a bar that separated the men and women. So moving and connecting. And when I found out that it was linked into the funeral dance, it really made sense in the, sen in, in the way that when your muscles are straining and you're in that part of challenge, like when people say, oh, you're in limbo and you think, oh yeah, I'm in that, I'm uncomfortable and I don't know what to do and it's a really difficult place. That's the place of this really, really deep back bend. And we're going into this, this place, but when you come out the other side, you've come through the transition. And what happened at the funerals was that if you could go through the bar really, really low, and you had someone who could pass under with just a breath of space between them and the bar, they would ease the movement of the spirit into the next world. So when you talked about Mekatha Lily and her funeral dancing and how it moves us through places and moves us through things, that just brought in for me the limbo every time and that challenge and that place of holding strong in order to get through to the next part. You know that 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 Mecca Chilili, the story, I first heard it in 2018 and my heart beat faster because it took me right back to primary school. I must have been about nine and we had this um, club, it was called African Dance and this young man came and he was running it and he taught us a dance from the Bamasaba people, my mother's people and she was in the middle of doing this oral research in her community and here was this dance and it was a funeral dance and they played drums, but the drums were made out of clay pots and they would hit them with a wad of banana fiber, poof, and then with their elbows. And then there was this deep, deep dance and the women would bend and it was danced by women. And I ran home and I told my mom, but we didn't know the dance because we were very, came from a very Christian background and those things were not done. And then in 2012, my mother passed away and I just so deeply wanted to do that dance to say farewell to her. But I didn't know who to ask. I knew that none of my people knew the dance. I don't even know if I had the courage to ask anybody about the dance, but that thing stayed inside of me, you know, wanting to do the dance. So you can imagine in 2018, there I was in Durban, in South Africa, at a storytelling festival run by Trinam Lope, And there was my friend Mshai Mwangola from Kenya. And she said, I have this story. I don't know if I'm ready to tell it. I'm not sure. And then when it was her turn to tell, she stood up and she opened her mouth. And this is the story that came out. And when I heard the Chifudu dance, and I heard her talk about the old women doing the Chifudu dance, and how that dance led a revolt and moved people out of a place where they would have been paralyzed into doing something, my heart, it beat, it beat faster. And, and that is for me, the beauty of this story, but also just a reminder that our people knew that you can dance grief. And sometimes dance is the only thing you can do to move you into another place. As those three goddesses stand around the well, they take a single thread. The oldest dips that deep, dark thread into the water, lifts it back out again and watches as a single drop of water 
spins and spins and spins and spins and falls down to earth. That single drop of water containing all the feelings of rage and anger and sadness felt by one single woman. Queen Draupadi of India, who lived a long, 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 long time ago. And as that single tear falls on the hot, cracked Indian soil and fizzles and dries beneath the hot Indian sun, Queen Draupadi's story begins. She sits in the corner of a gambling room, a woman who once commanded power at the very tips of her fingertips, commanded power with every movement of her body, was now sitting in the corner, hunched in on herself as she watched her husbands and men she did not know or did not care to know, tossing up dice high, high up into the air, each spin of the dice deciding one more layer of her fate. And as her stomach clenched with the pain of her lunar cycle and the pain of fear and the hot, hot rage of the fact that her destiny was being decided for her, she watched. The dice kept spinning and spinning and spinning and her future looked more precarious by the second. Malaya Sabhayalli Sireye Salavaga Krishna Krishna Vemba Nama Vekaito Balaya Sabayali Sireye Salavaga Krishna Krishna Vemba Nama Vekaito Balaya Sabayali They tried to strip me of what makes me powerful. They should have known that at my heart, I could not be disrobed. As the men played dice, I saw I was a possession to be bartered and traded, to be gambled for my worth. I have always known I meant more than this that I belonged to myself and the divine first, though my five husbands professed to love and honor me. Deeper and deeper slid Yudhishthra, the first of these five, into debt, as with every throw of the dice, he sold more and more of what belonged to him and what did not. When the sly enemy prince Dushasan dragged me by my hair into the gathering of men, 
I tasted shame. Not my own, but theirs. I knew I had been sold, though no one, no God, and no husband could ever wield such a right. Though the dice rolled to spell out my fate, I knew I needed to plea my case to the gods. Would Krishna hear me? By my hair, the men pulled at me, saying I was to be bare before them. I beseeched Krishna to come to my aid, to shield me, to save me so I could save myself. cloth of my sari, unwound and unwound, yet I did not become bare. Though my woman's blood was upon me, and I was meant to be hidden away from the eyes of men, as I stood there I realized I had never felt more powerful. The private red of my lunar cycle would not be spilled on this gambling room floor. I would retain what made me myself, a queen, a survivor, and a woman. By seeking to protect myself, I had gained the holiest of protections. You can strip me of my garments, but you cannot strip me of my dignity. 70 years, a long, long reign. If the rain were the tears that were shed of joy and of happiness, what stories might we tell? What seas might we fill? And what boats might sail across those seas to other lands that join us all up? Our grandmothers give us life. They are among our first wellsprings to the world. For as long as we live, wherever we live, our earthly roots are intertwined with theirs. Our grandmothers live with all the intricacy and complexity that goes into being a woman. We don't always see this when we're young, but in the full bloom of their womanhood, they offer us gifts of strength, of resilience, of determination, of round-bellied laughter and wizened face kisses of a love that may not ever be perfect, but is so often the most real thing we know. Our grandmothers, yours and mine, help us know that we are here, that our family lines, even if they are not royal, are strong vines and blooms of that flourishing, becoming trees tethered in the rich, dark soil. My grandmothers both worked the land of the Caribbean, tilling and toiling with their hands in the loam to bring forth a different kind of life to the one they carried in their bellies. Always they grew things, always 
they showed us how to grow too. Our grandmothers are our queens, be they with us or departed from this plane, be they resident in the United Kingdom, in Trinidad, in Uganda, in India, or any of the territories that make up our Commonwealth. And our common wealth is that we can draw on their power, their patience, the examples of their living for always. Ahalya Draupadi Sita Tara Mandodri Tatha Panchakanya Smare Nityam Mahapataka Nashana Oh my queen, it matters not whether you are a Sita or a Mandodri. I wish for you dignity, dignity that makes you a queen always. To all the queens of the Caribbean, my grandmothers, my mothers, to Nanny of the Maroons, and the queens of our first peoples. I celebrate your power. I am awed by your strength. To our queens, I wish you all the happiness beneath the sun. Don Bandi Sonas. Banna Bachala Bona Bagal is a sanu edivo Mueva Libyona. To all my queens, I wish you joy, so much joy. Thank you for all that you are. A la abuela de mi abuela, que es reina. And to the way in which grief can teach us to hold our heads high and move through things. To those queens. To all the queens who came before, who paved the way, who brought us into being, I give you gratitude. We are six women, six countries, many languages, who have come together for this short space of time. The threads of our lives weaving together to make one glorious pattern. We have travelled into immortal worlds, into the realms of wells and water, of the moon and the night and the tides that guide us. We have followed Queen Elizabeth onto that one yacht where she has expression over her life and the things that are gathered around her, the one place where no eye can see, no eye but that one eye at the bottom of the well that shows us all the clarity to see the past without prejudice, to see the present and all the possibilities within us, and to give us the strength to look into the future with determination and friendship. We gather here, six women, one commonwealth. Hey, hey, hey.